Muy buenas tardes, señoras y señores. Bienvenidos a este Palacio del Marqués de Salamanca, donde vamos a asistir a la tercera conferencia del ciclo La ciencia del cosmos, la ciencia en el cosmos. Este ciclo, que está organizado por la Fundación BBVA, está dirigido por la doctora Ana Achúcarro, catedrática de Física Teórica de las Universidades de Leiden y del País Vasco, y que nos acompaña esta tarde. En esta conferencia vamos a presenciar algunos de los avances recientes más sorprendentes de la astrofísica. Según los resultados del telescopio Kepler, el número de planetas extrasolares conocidos supera ya el millar. ¿Cómo se forman estos sistemas planetarios? ¿Con qué ingredientes químicos? ¿Qué papel juegan las moléculas del agua interestelar? ¿Cómo evoluciona la complejidad, la, la complejidad química para generar el material prebiótico y finalmente la vida? Pues bien, para responder a todas estas preguntas, contamos hoy con la presencia de la doctora Van Dysuk, la máxima autoridad mundial en astroquímica. Una materia especialmente difícil por su carácter interdisciplinar que incluye observaciones astronómicas, trabajos de laboratorio y de modelización tanto de física molecular como de astrofísica. Evin Van Dysuk, Van Dysuk. Sorry, Evin. es catedrática de Astronomía en la Universidad de Leiden, Holanda, donde se doctoró cum laude en 1984. Desde el año 2008 es además científica asociada en el Instituto Max Planck de Física Extraterrestre en Gargin, Alemania. Como decíamos, su labor investigadora se encuentra en la frontera de la física molecular, la química y la astronomía. Para sus investigaciones se sirve tanto de experimentos de laboratorio utilizando análogos de granos de polvo interestelares como de observaciones astronómicas que realiza utilizando telescopios tanto desde tierra como desde plataformas espaciales. Tras su doctorado, trabajó en la Universidad de Harvard, en el Instituto de Estudios Avanzados de Princeton y en el Instituto de Tecnología de California. En 1990 regresó a la Universidad de Leiden en calidad de profesora titular. Desde 1992 y hasta 2007 dirigió el laboratorio Raymond and Beverly Sackler experimentando con simulaciones de granos de polvo, estos análogos, de los que hablábamos antes, similares a lo que pensamos que es el polvo interestelar. En 1995 obtuvo la Cátedra de Astrofísica Molecular en Leiden. Su grupo de trabajo centra sus investigaciones en la evolución química que tiene lugar en el cosmos, desde las nubes interestelares hasta la formación de los discos protoplanetarios. Su labor científica viene poniendo de relieve la importancia de las moléculas interestelares como indicadores privilegiados de las condiciones físicas y de los procesos de formación de las estrellas y de los planetas. En paralelo con sus tareas de investigación, Evin Van Dysuk viene desempeñando diversos cargos de responsabilidad en el ámbito de la política científica internacional. Actualmente es directora del Netherlands Research School for Astronomy presidenta del Grupo de Trabajo de Astroquímica de la Unión Astronómica Internacional y miembro del Comité Científico Asesor de la Atacama Large Millimeter Array, veremos más tarde lo que es, del que fue su presidenta durante varios años. La profesora Van Dysuk ha sido invitada a impartir las conferencias más prestigiosas a nivel internacional, como son la Sackler y Cecilia Payne Gapos. Gaposkin en la Universidad de Harvard, la Niels Bohr de la Universidad de Copenhague, la Spitzer en la Universidad de Princeton y la Hewis en la Universidad de Cambridge. Sus investigaciones le han valido numerosos reconocimientos, entre ellos el premio Spinoza de la Fundación Holandesa 
para la ciencia en el año 2000, el premio Física de la Sociedad Holandesa de Física en 2005 y el premio Petri de la Sociedad Astronómica de Canadá en 2007. En el año 2008 ingresó en la Academia Americana de las Artes y las Ciencias. Finalmente, y ahora en un plano ya más personal, ya que nos conocemos desde hace más de 20 años, puedo dar fe de que Wim van die Schuck es una persona verdaderamente excepcional. Su capacidad de trabajo y su tenacidad sirven de ejemplo continuo para toda la comunidad de astroquímica repartida por todo el mundo. Como algunos de ustedes saben, estos días nos encontramos celebrando en Toledo el Congreso Mundial de esta disciplina. Pues bien, Evin es el auténtico alma de este Congreso, una animadora extremadamente entusiasta y eficaz para esta comunidad de varios cientos de personas que nos reunimos una vez cada varios años. Algunos de los mayores resultados de, las, de los que se han presentado en este Congreso proceden del proyecto WISH, Agua en el Medio Interestelar, por sus siglas en inglés, que Evin ha venido promoviendo con grandísima energía y eficacia. Paso pues la palabra a Evin, a la que debemos recibir con un cálido aplauso. Muchas gracias, eh, Rafael, y buenas noches, eh, señores y señoras. Uh, please permit me to continue in English uh, for this lecture. <laughs> so it's a great pleasure for me to be here tonight. Um, it's a beautiful evening, and I'm very glad that so many of you came here. Uh, perhaps after the lecture, you will go outside and you will look up to the stars. It may be even better to go a little bit outside of Madrid rather than right in Madrid. But when you look up to the sky, you will see the stars, you will see the moon, you will see some planets, maybe you will even see some galaxies. And so what I'm going to tell you today is I'm going to take you off a tour of these heavens to see really how those macroscopic phenomena that we see on the sky, the stars, the planets, the moons, how they were made. Because these are not eternal. They are being born and they die just like all of us. So, but before I start with the science, I want to put this in a somewhat broader perspective. Because the origin of stars and the origin of planets and our own solar system uh, has fascinated mankind, and you find that in all kinds of art. You find it in music, you find it in poems, but you also find it in paintings. And one of my own hobbies, when I'm not doing astronomy, is actually to look at astronomy and art. And in Holland, that's not so difficult, because we have our famous painter, Vincent van Gogh, who has painted uh, several versions of the Starry Night. So you see here the Big Dipper. Um, but all kinds of other painters across the globe have also been inspired by the heavens. And here in Spain, certainly Juan Miró has painted many uh, pictures uh, that are inspired by astronomy. Think of the red sun, for example. And this is also a beautiful example. This is the comet. Here you see the comet with its tails. And here you see the stars. And this is all in the constellation Serpent. Um, if we go to the other side of the world, to Australia, uh, we see here the Aboriginal art. Of course, in the desert in Australia, it's very dark, so there uh, the people are very used to a beautiful night sky. And what they see is the Seven Sisters, the Pleiades that you have over here, and here is Orion. And the story goes, is that uh, the mother of the seven sisters actually hit them, uh, put them actually in the dust of the Milky Way uh, because the old man, Orion, was chasing them and she wanted to protect uh, her children from him. We go to another part of the universe, uh, to actually to our own globe, uh, to uh, the Pacific Northwest in Canada. 
And here they have another story as to how our sun was formed. Here it was really first Raven who took the sun actually out of a dark box uh, and put it then on the sky. And that's exactly what we're going to see. We're going to see as to how these stars actually originate from a dark, very dark box, which we call a dark cloud. So as Professor Bachier already said in his introduction, uh, we live in a very special time. 15 years ago, we knew only one solar system, our own. Our own star, the sun, and our own planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Earth, etc. But in 1995, started a revolution. The first extrasolar planet was discovered, that is a planet around another star than our own sun. And by now, more than a thousand of these exoplanets have been discovered in just a decade uh, of time. And so this has made many of these age-old questions, questions as to where do these stars and planets come from? How unique are we? How unique is our own solar system? Which of all of these exoplanets could be habitable? And then a topic that is quite close to my own heart, uh, what are the chemical ingredients? What are sort of the building blocks that are available to, uh, um, to build these planets? So let's our, start our journey. So let's start uh, our journey here in the Milky Way. So um, that's our galaxy. A galaxy is nothing else but a collection of some hundreds of billions of uh, stars. And so our star, our sun, is just one of these hundreds of uh, billions of stars that make up our galaxy, our Milky Way. And if we would be able to stand outside our Milky Way and look at it from the side, then we actually see here uh, a rather flat disk with some uh, concentration of stars here in the center. Um, now, what I'm going to talk about is really everything that is uh, very close to our own star, the sun. So it's basically in our cosmic backyard. Um, but the processes that I'm talking about, we now know they happen all through our entire Milky Way and even also through the other hundreds of billions of galaxies that are present in the universe. So where, do we, where are we going to make our stars? We are going to make them uh, in the very empty space between the stars. So when you look again up at the sky and you see those stars, you think that maybe there's just simply nothing in between these stars. But that's not true. It's actually filled with a very, very, very dilute gas. Only one atom per cubic centimeter. And it is in this very dilute gas that the stars are born. So let's uh, see whether we can find some of these clouds. Um, does somebody in the audience recognize this constellation? All right, yes, Orion. <laughs> Good. So uh, Orion is the uh, uh, hunter, a Greek hunter. So here you see his uh, uh, upper part, then here you see his legs, and here is his sword. And right here in the middle of that sword is a tiny nebula, and that was seen already in uh, uh, around 1500 uh, by Galileo and later by Christian Huygens. Um, and uh, uh, if you now look at it with a modern telescope, um, then you see here not just a few stars, as uh, Galileo saw, but, but really uh, you see now hundreds of uh, stars actually appearing. Um, and so when the nebula was first discovered, people didn't know that this was actually the birthplace of stars. Uh, William Herschel, a very famous uh, uh, English astronomer, uh, already speculated that this nebulous gas that you see here could be the chaotic material of future suns. But at that time, it was still completely unknown that stars were being born and that they would die again. So let's look at a little bit more modern uh, uh, image of the Orion Nebula. Now with uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, so here is again this, uh, this inner part will come back to the Orion Nebula uh, multiple times during this lecture. 
But now we also start to see some of these dark parts. And let's look at some more of them. This is also a famous nebula. It's the horse head nebula, because you see it looks some, something like the, the head of a horse. <laughs> and if you zoom into it, this is what it looks like uh, with a bigger telescope. And it's really inside these very dense and dark concentrations of the interstellar gas that new generations of stars are being born. These clouds are so dark because they contain not just gas, but they also contain very, very tiny particles uh, of dust. So think of grains that you find also on the beach, uh, a little sand grain, um, that uh, little silicate grain that is present here in these clouds. And as you probably know, uh, also from, from smoke, for example, uh, in, a, in a restaurant, well, when you were still allowed to smoke in a restaurant, <laughs> uh, that uh, you were not able to look very deep into the restaurants because these solid particles, they absorb and scatter the light. And that's also what is happening here. These, dars, these clouds are so dark because these particles absorb and scatter the background light. So let's look at a beautiful example. This is a true, what we call a coal sack, a dark cloud. So here are the thousands and thousands of stars in the Milky Way. And this uh, dark cloud over here is just basically hanging in front of it. And so the stars that are uh, behind this cloud, uh, you cannot see through this cloud. Because again, these dust particles uh, assume, uh, absorb all the radiation. So such a cloud consists mostly of gas, and the gas is actually mostly hydrogen. Hydrogen that was made actually in the Big Bang. Um, but about 1% by mass consists of this dust particles, so these small sand particles, about a tenth of a micron in size. So that is about a uh, one thousandth, uh, tens of thousands of a uh, millimeter. So much less than the, the thickness of a, a human hair. These clouds are also incredibly cold. They are only just above absolute zero. Um, here in this room, it's about uh, 20, 25 degrees Celsius. Well, this is uh, minus 260 degrees Celsius. And they are also very tenuous. So there is only about uh, 10,000 particles per cubic centimeters. Here in this room, in one cubic centimeter contains 10 to the 19 uh, particles. So 10 with 19 zeros behind it. And even a, uh, a laboratory, a good vacuum in a laboratory on Earth, um, still has uh, uh, many more, uh, about a million times more particles per cubic centimeter. So this is really a very special laboratory. And that's also what makes it so interesting for us, is that uh, we have here actually a, a rather unique chemical laboratory that we can study. So it's interesting both for astronomers, but also for chemists. Okay, well, we can see these dark clouds very nicely, but we cannot see what is inside. So to see what is inside, we actually have to start to put on different glasses. We have not to start to look with our, the light that we can see with our eyes, but we have to put on uh, infrared glasses. So we go to longer wavelengths. And we see that if we look now at the same picture at longer wavelengths, then we start to see actually through the clouds, and we start to see all of these background stars, and we can actually study what is inside the cloud. So this is actually a nice uh, uh, little video animation. It's based on astronomical data taken with the Spitzer Space Telescope from one of our programs. And we start again at the light that we see with our, op with our own eyes, the visible light. So here we start with the visible light, and now we zoom in, and we zoom also to, to longer and longer wavelengths. And now we see that it's no longer dark, and we can actually see that inside this cloud, a new star is actually being born. So here you see the young stars, and you see already it's trying to push away through some bipolar outflows, through some jets. It's trying to push away, actually, this uh, surrounding uh, uh, material. 
And so that is actually what we're going to study. We're going to study this very early phase of the formation of a young star uh, when it's ritually still being born. And so this is also where the Herschel Space Observatory is so powerful because Herschel is really sort of lifting the veil, the, the cosmic veil uh, of these clouds. And so with the, the Herschel uh, telescopes, we are now able to make uh, these very beautiful uh, images of clouds in which young stars are being born. So a little tour of the telescopes that we are using. Uh, we are very fortunate that uh, as the European astronomers, we have access to several very powerful telescopes. Um, these, is, uh, these are the, the very large telescope, uh, which is on Paranal in Chile. Uh, in northern Chile. And so these are four telescopes, each with a diameter of about uh, eight meters. And uh, they are very powerful at, at looking inside these clouds. We can go to even longer wavelengths. We can go to the millimeter wavelengths, so like you have in your microwave. And uh, there we travel uh, either to Hawaii so here you see some powerful telescopes there in which uh, my country, the Netherlands, is involved. This 15 meter diameter telescope here on the top of uh, Mauna Kea. Um, but we also can go to Spain. Here in Spain, in Granada, is one of the most powerful millimeter telescopes, the IRAM 30 meter telescopes. And the astronomy groups here in Spain have done some very beautiful work um, especially with this telescope. And my field uh, of uh, astrochemistry has benefited enormously from this uh, very powerful uh, facility. Um, there are also, you can use not just one telescope, but you can actually combine the signals of six telescopes um, and make an even more powerful instrument. And again, uh, the Spanish community is very much involved in that. Then, indeed, we, have, we can go to space. So in space, of course, we have the advantage uh, that we are above the Earth's atmosphere. So especially molecules like water, which are present in high abundances in our own atmosphere, uh, there you really have to go to space in order to observe them. And so after working on this uh, telescope for some 30 years, it was finally launched. Uh, about two years ago by the European Space Agency. It's a three and a half meter telescope, so it's really the largest astronomical telescope in space, even larger than the Hubble Space Telescope. And it looks really at this long wavelengths at the, the far infrared part of the spectrum. And it's really a testimony to the collaborations uh, both between the countries within Europe and also between Europe and the United States that we have such powerful instruments on board these telescopes, this telescope. Another telescope that we hope to be using very soon is the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, ALMA. It's truly my soul, ALMA, <laughs> um, this telescope. Um, it's an array of uh, some 66 telescopes with a diameter of 12 meters that is being built at a high altitude plane in Chile at 5,000 meters at Llano de Chasantor. It's really at the border of Argentina and Bolivia and Chile. And uh, hopefully in 2013, it uh, will look something like this. This is the actual surroundings. It's one of the most beautiful places on Earth uh, to go to. And uh, I can assure you, and Professor Bachelier can testify to that as well, that it is literally, it's figuratively, but also literally a breathtaking experience to be up there at this altitude at 5,000 meters and uh, be, be there with these telescopes. So hopefully uh, by the uh, end of this year, we'll start using this, uh, this very uh, wonderful machine. Okay, so those are the instruments that we are using. Uh, now let's go back a little bit to the ingredients that we find in these clouds. Um, so this is the astronomer's version of the periodic table that you probably all had in high school at some stage. Um, so according to astronomers, it's mostly hydrogen. That was uh, made in the Big Bang. So if you put that one by number, then the next uh, most abundant element is helium. 
but helium doesn't do much in terms of chemistry, so we'll forget about helium. Um, and then we actually go to the next uh, row of the periodic table, and there we go to the very interesting elements, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, which together with hydrogen make up a lot of the elements that we are made of. So it's these, instrument, these elements that we are really uh, interested in. If you go even further down, we drop by another order of magnitude. But so what you see is really that these elements are present only in one part of almost 10 to the 4, almost one part in 10,000 compared with hydrogen. So we have this very, very dilute gas, very cold. You know, another molecule will encounter another particle maybe once every month or so. Um, and a reaction may take place maybe once only 10 to the 5 years. Um, but still these uh, elements manage to find each other and make molecules. This is not something that chemists had predicted. They said to the astronomers, don't even bother building these telescopes, don't even bother looking for molecules, you won't find them. Um, but fortunately the astronomers didn't listen uh, to the uh, chemists. And by now we have uh, found this wonderful inventory of, uh, of molecules in space. So more than uh, some 150 different species have now been found. Uh, some of them are rather ordinary molecules that you would uh, buy in a bottle. Uh, you may recognize here ammonia, water, formaldehyde. This is a molecule that some of you may recognize. Alcohol, yes, ethanol, <laughs> very good. So yes, there's alcohol uh, present in, uh, in space. So uh, if at the end of this lecture you uh, don't have anywhere to go to get a drink, then you can go and tap a beer in interstellar space. But uh, remember that it's not quite 40%, it's actually less than 1% uh, with respect to water. <laughs> so uh, we find this uh, rather ordinary molecules, um, but also one of the surprises is what there was a quite exotic chemistry going on. So we are actually discovering molecules in space that were discovered there before they were ever seen in a laboratory on Earth. These are very stable molecules, uh, protonated uh, carbon monoxide, protonated nitrogen, very long carbon chains. Um, which uh, uh, are actually quite st stable in space, but which are very reactive in a laboratory on Earth. And so that's why we call them exotic, but actually in space they are quite common. It also immediately illustrates that we have a quite unusual chemistry, uh, because we have here, you know, a chain with some seven or nine carbons there, just one hydrogen uh, attached to it. And this is very weird, because we have 10,000 times more hydrogen than carbon. And yet you make these molecules that are very carbon rich and uh, very little hydrogen. So that tells you already that the, the chemistry in space is not in what we call thermodynamic equilibrium, but is really determined by the uh, reactions between the individual uh, uh, atoms uh, present there. This is just some very beautiful data that have just come down from the Herschel Space Observatory. Don't try to read it, it's just to illustrate that there are both simple and complex molecules present in space, there is water present in space, um, and you see here even molecules as complex as uh, methyl formates, uh, ethyl cyanides, uh, etc. And a lot of methanol lines actually uh, present here. So you can literally say that these molecules are, are spaced out. So let's just look at some of the molecules that have been detected. So um, here are some uh, simple what we call organic or even maybe prebiotic molecules, um, like an ether, or here we have our friend ethanol, here we have a sugar, a methyl formate, and these have all been detected and are quite common in interstellar space. Not yet detected are the molecules that you may think are the precursors for life, like glycine, like bases, pyrimidine, or pyrimidine. And this little molecule here, 
which may not be necessary for the uh, origin of life, but is certainly necessary for the maintenance of life, which is called uh, caffeine. <laughs> Um, but this is just to illustrate that these molecules are not much more complex than the ones that have already been detected. So we think that with these new powerful telescopes like ALMA uh, and also with Herschel, we can actually now look much deeper into these clouds, much more sensitive, and that soon we will be able to detect sort of these uh, first building blocks of uh, uh, prebiotic uh, matter. Even more complex molecules are present in space. Um, these molecules we know are present as a class. Uh, these are the so-called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PAHs. Sounds very complicated, but you are very familiar with these molecules because they are very much present in the exhaust of your car, the auto exhaust. Uh, they're also present when you barbecue your meats and then you create a lot of uh, PAHs, actually. So these are very common molecule, actually, throughout the universe. We see them basically everywhere where we look in space. And very recently, another very interesting class of molecules was detected. Uh, these is, we, we call them the fullerenes. Um, they are also called buckyballs because they look like a soccer ball. And these are actually uh, one of the uh, stable forms of carbon, uh, C60, uh, that you see over here, and also C70, basically cages of, uh, of carbon atoms. And these uh, molecules have now become uh, you know, in, uh, very prominent on, in laboratories on Earth. People use them to make nanotubes and all kinds of nanomaterials. Uh, but lots of the inspiration for all of this research came actually from observations of molecules in space um, because the Nobel laureates who discovered these molecules were actually astrochemists looking for these molecules in space. So far, I've only talked about molecules that are present as a gas. Um, but if a molecule actually collides with one of these cold dust grains, uh, the molecule will actually freeze out on it. So think of a cold winter night, and you have your car standing outside, and when you come in the morning, then you see that there is a layer of ice actually frozen out onto, you, onto your windshield. So that's basically water from the uh, atmosphere freezing out onto your uh, uh, windscreen. And uh, uh, that's the same thing is happening in space. These tiny dust grains actually act as a deep freeze, and the elements from the gas can actually land on the grain and then react with hydrogen to form more hydrogen-rich molecules. And so we now know that the ice in space has actually many different flavors. It's not just water ice, but it's also methane ice, it's ammonia ice, um, there are some carbon dioxide there, so that's the bubbles actually in the interstellar ice cocktail. And then there is also some methanol present there. So literally, the alcohol that we have in space is actually present on the rocks. So what we do actually in our laboratory in uh, Leiden is that we uh, try to simulate these processes in space. And so what we try to do is actually simulate these very cold fingers. We deposit these ices on there and then we study, basically, we simulate actually what is happening inside these clouds. The only difference that we make is that we speed up the processes a little bit because we cannot wait for 10,000 years for a reaction to occur. Our PhD students typically have four years for their uh, write their dissertation, so they have to be uh, able to do these experiments in less time. Uh, but for the rest, we basically have a, a little piece of interstellar space simulated in the laboratory, uh, a laboratory that is now led by uh, uh, Professor Harold Linnart. So let me tell you a little bit more about water, because certainly this is one of the most important molecules if you think about the origin of life. And again, you see that all through, through art. You see here, Leonardo da Vinci already talked that water is the blood of the planet. And going back much further in history, Thales of Mileta already said that basically all the matter comes from water. It involves water in some, some way. We actually consist mostly of water. 
If you look at the division of the elements that we have in our body, actually most of it is in the form of uh, oxygen, in the form of water. And then the water is, of course, important, uh, not just for the chemistry of life, but also for, for the geology and the climate of our planet, which is determined by water. Um, so that leads then to the question, where does actually the water that we see on Earth, you know, that we have here in our oceans, where did that actually come from? Um, you know, is it very recent, or maybe was it already delivered uh, 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 to our Earth by comets. And so that's the question that we're actually starting to observe now with our data from the Herschel Space Observatory. So actually, uh, the, 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 let me just jump immediately already to some of the clues, because we think that actually a lot of the water is made on these dust grains, actually in these very dark clouds that you see over here. And we now know that because in these data that we now have from our water in space, star forming regions with Herschel pro program um, is that we can now detect the signatures of water, uh, basically the, the fingerprints of water, we can now detect very nicely with our uh, uh, telescope. And this is a very nice collaboration. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, the Spanish group uh, led by Professor Bachier is also very much uh, involved in this, uh, uh, in this work and uh, try helping us to explain uh, the much of our uh, data. So the picture that we are now getting from uh, all of these data is actually that uh, we have these various atoms landing here on one of these dust grains, and there we form then, uh, when they move over the grain, we form actually molecules like uh, water. And we can even form some of these more complex organic molecules that we find in space through these reactions that are occurring here on these dust grains. So let's look at it once again. So here we form CH4, here we form carbon dioxide, we are forming water, we are forming more complex molecules, we have a little bit of radiation which leads to even more complex molecules, and then when we get close to a young star, then we evaporate everything back into the gas phase. So if somebody asks you where the water here in this glass comes from, then it was actually made on a dust grain some four and a half billion years ago when our own solar system was formed from such a dark cloud. So summary so far, interstellar clouds have a very rich and chemical composition in spite of the very cold and tenuous conditions. So it looks like a very hostile environment, but it is not the case. It is actually a very rich chemical uh, 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 soup there. And among these molecules, we find actually water, and we also find rather complex organic molecules. The ingredients that we need for life uh, are found actually around nearly all forming stars throughout the Milky Way. So that's the first take home message is that actually these building blocks for prebiotic material are actually widespread uh, uh, through our galaxy. So let's now go a little bit more to the astronomy. So let's now actually see how we actually make one uh, a new star like our sun. So let's take our dark cloud again that we have over here. And now we need to go from here to a star. So what happens? Basically the cloud will start to collapse and then uh, the matter here will concentrate so much that the heat can no longer escape and then uh, nuclear reactions will start and build a star. So let's look at that. Here we have our cloud collapsing. We have our protostar forming in the center. At the same time, the young star already starts to develop a wind which starts to blow away the surrounding material. We also have uh, a rotating disk around a young star because of conservation of angular momentum, and that then eventually leads to a planetary system like our own. So that's the basic, in a nutshell, actually, how a planetary system like our own was formed. Um, let's talk a little bit more about time scales, um, because this looked like it happened already rather quickly. And that's indeed the case. So let's look and uh, use an example that m many of you may actually familiar with. Um, 
several of you know probably about the Grand Canyon. You may have been there even, beautiful place to go. Um, and if you go there, you look at the Grand Canyon, um, and you, there's actually a beautiful hike that you can do. You can go down from the rib to the Colorado River, uh, some two kilometers uh, down in this, uh, in, in this valley. And if you take that trip, then you actually pass through a whole range of geology. You go from very young uh, rocks, like here the limestone, and you go deeper and deeper into this canyon, and then you pass older and older rocks until you're at the bottom near the river, and there your rocks are some two billion years old. Um, so the time scale actually for star formation, the time that it takes to form a star, is astronomically speaking very short. It takes about as much time as the first 10 meters of the descent into the Grand Canyon. So it takes only a few million years in total. So it's actually very rapid. Okay, so let's look at this now in more detail in a beautiful movie that was made of the Orion uh, Nebula. So here we see again our friends, the uh, trapezium stars. And uh, now we are actually gonna fly through this uh, nebula. So this is actually astronomical data taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. But from a 2D image, this astronomer has made a 3D image. And we are zooming here through this. We are finding all of our protostars. And now we are seeing here, now this is an animation. And now we're seeing here a protostar here actually with this rotating disk of material around it. And also this jet uh, that pushes away the surrounding material. And so that is very important. So let's look at this movie again, because it is so beautiful. <laughs> so here we have the Orion Nebula. Here's the trapezium stars. We are now starting to travel through it. We're seeing here all of these protostars, young stars still surrounded by their envelopes, their cocoons in which they are formed. Here you see a nice protostar. And now we go here to the simulation. And now you see here this protostar, it's, this, this cocoon is basically blown away, both by the radiation from the stars and by this outflow. And now we have here this disk, this rotating disk of material, and this is where the planets are formed. So we're gonna focus basically on that disk, rotating disk of material. So here is uh, actually now back to an astronomical image of such a young system, a young star that we obtained with the Herschel Space Telescope. This is actually very much uh, work from the Italian group and also the Spanish group, uh, Professor Bachier and Dr. Mario Tavaglia, um, who have been leading this uh, research. And uh, this is actually what our own young uh, star uh, looked like. So we see here the young star itself glowing already in water. And we see here these jets, and these jets are really also glowing in water. Basically, the, the energetic processes that accompany the formation of a young star are actually creating a lot of water. So it's a direct demonstration that there's lots of warm water associated with forming stars. If we now look again at this uh, Orion image from the movie, then what we see here, if we zoom in here onto these specks, then we see here actually these young stars with these disks of material surrounding them. So again, we see these as dark images because they contain these dust grains, which makes them very dark. <coughs> so here you see uh, one of these disks face on, and here you see it edge on, the young star is actually hidden behind it. <coughs> and so these images were actually discovered in 1995, around the same time that the first exoplanets were discovered, and they told us immediately that this was the origin of solar systems, because these disks were proven to have the size actually of our own solar system, if you would put it at the distance of the Orion Nebula. So we now actually know that these disks are very common. We know that the majority of the young stars is surrounded by these disks. We know that the sizes of these disks are comparable to size 
of our own solar system, so the distance from the sun to the most distant planet, that used to be Pluto. Pluto is no longer a planet, it's a dwarf planet, but still that's about the size of our solar system. Um, and also the masses of these disks are usually enough to form a solar system. So about 1% of the mass of the sun or 10 times the mass of Jupiter. So they have enough material to form a planetary system like our own. In our own solar system, Jupiter has the bulk of the mass available. So what we see also is that the ingredients for planet formation are actually very common in our galaxy. Another very recent development is that we have been able to use some of these space telescopes to now zoom in into the heart of this protoplanetary disk and search for molecules there, search for organic material there. And in a recent study, we actually showed that these inner regions of these disks are very abundant in molecules that are, again, the building blocks of life. So, for example, hydrogen cyanide, if you have six of these molecules together, you make an amino acid. And similar, acetylene is a building block of these uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So, large abundances of warm organic molecules are found in the planet's uh, forming zones of these disks. So then the question is, how do we actually make the planets? And that's a little bit still of a, a, a black art in the sense, a bit of a magic, that we don't fully understand it. We start with this disk with micron-sized particles, and we need to grow to something that is as large as our planet, uh, 10,000 10, kilometers in diameter. And so what we think is that gradually all of these particles actually stick together to larger and larger uh, particles, but certainly that process is not yet well understood. Okay, so let me step back again to uh, astronomy and art, because this is actually an engraving uh, that is at our uh, home in uh, the Netherlands, um, which uh, depicts uh, multiple planetary systems. So it dates already from several centuries ago. It shows here in the center our own solar system, as people knew it at that time. So the sun, and at that time people knew seven planets, and maybe a few comets that we see up here. But this artist already speculated about other planetary systems. And he said already, well, those other planetary systems, they don't need to look like our own planetary system. They can have more planets, they can have fewer planets, they can be closer to the star than in our case, they can be much further from the star than in our solar system. So, of course, a lot of that was speculation at that time, uh, but that is now exactly what we are learning from the new observations that we are getting on these exoplanets. If you look here at our own solar system, then here we have the sun, and then here we have uh, uh, Mercury, Venus, the Earth, sort of the third rock from the Sun, Mars, long time nothing, then Jupiter, Saturn, etc. And our theoreticians have beautiful explanations as to why Jupiter had to be exactly at this location, that it was formed actually over here, and that uh, that was the only place it could be. The first thing that we learned from these exoplanetary systems is that they are very different. They can have these planets actually much closer to the star, not just one giant planet, but also multiple giant planets much closer to the star. Or they can have them actually much further away. And these are actually some of the very first images of exoplanets that people have now been able to obtain with very powerful telescopes. This is actually a system with three exoplanets, and this one is actually with one exoplanet. And these were at much larger distances than predicted. And now with the Kepler Space Telescope, a Kepler Observatory, just in the last uh, week, uh, 1,200 new exoplanets were, uh, candidates were actually announced. And so look at this. You know, this is one example of them. 
but this is the whole collection of them, and they come in all sizes, in all diameters, in all characters, uh, all very rich uh, 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 variety of these uh, exoplanets. Uh, the way that the Kepler Observatory detects them is because these planets actually pass in front of the star, and so when they actually pass in front of the star, like you see here, a little bit of the stellar light is being dimmed out, and that is what the Kepler uh, Observatory actually detects. So here's another example uh, of a somewhat bigger uh, dip, and here a somewhat uh, smaller dip, and so in that way they can derive actually the size of the planet. And so this is now a very active field and very new field uh, of exoplanetary uh, uh, planetology that is now being developed. Lots of excitement. But these planets are already mature. They have already formed. What we are interested in is actually what led to this diversity of planets, some close by, some further away. And to understand that, you really have to go back to that earlier phase when the star was still being formed and when the disk around the young star uh, was uh, uh, still present. Because here is actually uh, the results of a simulation. So if you see this simulation, uh, hydrodynamic simulation, here is the young star, here is the planet, and we cannot see this planet itself with our telescopes, but what we can see is the fact that its planet actually creates a whole in this disk, and that we can actually see with our telescopes this hole that the planet has evacuated. And that's for us then a signpost uh, that an, a planet is actually being formed. And it is really this interaction of the young planet with the disk that leads actually uh, to uh, the structures that we see in the planetary systems. Finally, let me then make the connection with our own solar system. So what you see here is actually a comet, a very powerful comet, Hale-Bopp. Uh, you could see it with the naked eye in 1995. More recently, we have seen some other comets. I think Comet McNaught was the, the most recent one that you could see with the naked eye. Um, and when you look at them, uh, what you see actually is a whole tail of gas that is uh, emanating actually from the nucleus. So uh, a comet is actually nothing else but a, a dirty ice ball. It's actually these dust grains <coughs> with these ices that have coagulated and that have formed sort of a kilometer-sized nucleus. Um, so actually, these comets are not much else but <coughs> actually contain um, the same ices that we saw before. So actually what happens in the early phases is that uh, these comets actually have a composition that looks very much like that what we have seen in interstellar space. So it contains actually <coughs> also these organic molecules. And so what we have actually is the question as to whether these molecules can actually be delivered then to a young planet. So let's just look at what happens. Ah, a big explosion. That's not good. That big explosion will actually destroy most of the organic ma ma material that was present actually <coughs> on the planet. So here we see this again. So this is actually what happened <coughs> to also our, <coughs> our own young Earth, is that a lot of the material, a lot of the material actually um, an impact like this actually created our own moon. And so the young planet, if it was that hot, not much water and organic material <coughs> would actually survive. So <coughs> if you ask the question, can these comets, these relents of the uh, early solar system, can they actually bring water and organic material to the new planets? And then you have to do it a little bit more gradual. That is actually what you see over here, is that if a comet doesn't impact directly, 
and uh, but sort of loses the material a little bit more gradually. And if that can come on the earth, then we can actually deliver quite a lot of water and organic material <coughs> onto the young earth. And that is actually what we think actually happens in our own solar system and the way of bringing this material there. So let me then come to the summary of my lecture. Just in time, <laughs> I'm getting my voice back again. Um, so what we have here is actually the cloud, uh, where we have seen that we have actually a lot of different molecules present. From that we form a disk, and we are just starting to study the chemistry actually in this disk. Out of this disk, comets can form, and these comets actually have a chemistry <clears throat> that is very similar to what we find actually in these interstellar clouds. And some of that material can then actually be brought back here onto the young planet and maybe lead to even much more complicated molecules like the ones you see here uh, that may lead to the formation of life. But this picture also illustrates that uh, stars, like you see over here, illuminating this planet, do not have the eternal life. At some stage, they run out of their nuclear fuel and they will die off. At that stage, our planet will no longer uh, um, survive. It will basically be, be completely swollen up, swallowed up and, uh, and dispersed into space. And so this is actually the state at which the new elements, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, etc., cetera, uh, are being then returned to the interstellar medium and then get back into the interstellar cloud and then a whole new cycle of star formation and planet formation actually occurs. So um, you see also that we, you know, our sun may already be sort of a, a next generation of stars. There have been generations of stars actually before our star already in the interstellar medium. Okay, so I hope that in this lecture I've shown you that chemical ingredients are present throughout space and are associated with forming stars, that planetary systems are possible around the majority of stars. So we have the ingredients for life, we have the ingredients to make planets, but the big question is still, how can we bring that material actually onto a planet intact without evaporating and destroying all of it? And how we're going to do that is to use actually powerful new telescopes uh, to allow astronomers to zoom in on these young planetary systems. <clears throat> Let me just show you some of the most powerful telescopes that will come online in the next uh, few years. This is actually the James Webb Space Telescope, the successor of the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, which is a six meter diameter telescope uh, which will hopefully be launched uh, around 2018. So it's really going to be, the, by then, the, the biggest telescope in space, even larger than the Herschel Space Observatory. Uh, on the ground, we are planning for the so-called European Extremely Large Telescope, which will have about a 40-meter mirror. And at the moment, uh, the, uh, the planning is such that hopefully first light will be somewhere around 2022. 20, uh, and this is an artist's impression of what it will look like. So this will then be really a, a major achievement of Europe to put all of this together. And then finally, let me end again with uh, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, this wonderful machine that we're building in northern Chile, and um, which will hopefully start to come online in the next uh, uh, few years. So at the moment, there are some 10 telescopes on the site, and in a couple of years, we hope to have uh, all 66 telescopes actually on the site. And this is a simulation of what ALMA will look at then at that stage. So here you see these 66 telescopes all following one single object on the sky, and um, the signals then of these telescopes are combined, um, and then they are combined such that you get a much sharper image than you would be able to get from one single telescope. And so it's really a wonderful uh, testimony of the, also of the technology uh, that is being developed 
that we can actually couple all of the signals of these telescopes and then create a much sharper image of our uh, uh, star forming regions than we would be able to do uh, otherwise. So let me then end with a picture of a new world. May look like our own, may not look like our own. Here is the star, here is a new planet, maybe like Jupiter, maybe something like Earth, here may be a moon around it. Uh, at the moment we are discovering these uh, new planetary systems, maybe in some 50 years we'll be able to make actually an image of these uh, new planetary systems. Thank you very much. <laughs>